Can I get hey everybody, the, uh, this is Anqui and Jatin Kataria. Give me the, they want to talk to you about a monitor darkly. Give right. me a round. Give me, come on. Congratulations yeah. for getting up here. <laughs> Vegas. Thank you. All right, we're going to get stuff shown on the monitors. And it's all going to work. All right. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is work that we've done for the last two years in our spare time. So uh, I wanted to tell you the story of how we did it and uh, what we found uh, over that time. So we have a big cast of characters. Okay, my name is Ang. Jaden is underneath this table. He will sometime reappear for this talk. Uh, we have a very strong Canadian named Francois, uh, the, who we worked with, but he couldn't show up to this. Today we have a person named Igor, which we'll talk about. We have a very uh, and a concerned area man named Chris. And uh, last but definitely not least, we have area man of concern named Shakib. And if you see his face on your monitor, things are really going to be bad. And he's actually in the, in the audience today. So. <laughs> Watch out. All right, so today's primary main objective is to go after these little devices that you connect to your computer that puts pixels up, right? Monitors, we all know what they are, okay? And uh, you know, motivation for why we are interested in monitors. You know, a good hacker, right, is a lazy hacker. So if you think about this page, right, <clears throat> uh, when you see this page, you, you think you're talking to your bank, right, the little green pixels on the, uh, on the left side here, right, makes you think this is an encrypted communication and you're safe. Now, think about all the resources and the research and, and the, the money we spend to create this infrastructure uh, so that we can have this internet with you know, SSL, right, that will show you these green pixels. You know, you have to secure the browser, you have to secure the kernel, you have to secure, you know, the infrastructure for doing certificates and all this other stuff. I would say we probably cumulatively probably invested over a billion dollars to make this infrastructure exist today the way it does. Okay, so let's look at the context in which we see this website, okay? So we view it through this tiny little computer with a big screen on it that we call the monitor, right? So the lazy hacker would say, you know, if I wanted to break the pixels that show me green, I could either break the security for, you know, that's, you know, built with a billion dollars of investment or whatever the security is inside this little monitor, right? And, you know, maybe it's not so great. And that's what we're here to talk about, okay? So this whole thing started back in 2015. When, uh, when Jad and I got really sweet new monitors, okay, so we bought these things and we said, wow, this is beautiful. And uh, as soon as we plugged it in, you know, we noticed uh, this really curious thing, right? The USB device on it said, you know, TUSB 3410 boot device, right? And the USB to I2C solution. So we looked at that and we said, oh, it's very interesting, right? So like a minute of Googling later, we found this really useful uh, Dell forum uh, response by Chris. Uh, so somebody asked, Hey, you know, I, I don't have a driver for this, you know, T34, you know, 3410 boot device. You know, what is it for? Is it a problem? And Chris from Dell says, eh, don't worry about it. You know, that driver is only there for firmware updates, which we'll probably never do, right? But if you want the driver, here it is. And I, I looked at that and I said, how interesting, right? So Jaden and I started thinking and I say, hey, Jaden, let's tear down this 34 inch monitor that we have lying around. Well, we already have awesome monitors. Uh, why don't we take that uh, 34 inch, which is not doing anything? Yeah. And then, we're cool with this, but then Chris hears this, right, you know, nearby, and he says, like, these monsters have no heart. Like, there's no end to their savagery. And I also have a million Vim plugins, and my life is sad, right? And, and we said, oh, this is really the saddest thing I've ever seen. So Why? where are we going to find these monitors? Why don't we go to the interns? They don't need monitors. Yeah, we and can. they have, like, Dell 2410 sitting around doing nothing. Yeah, we got a pit of interns. They get 24-inch monitors. They don't need them, right? So we started looking at the 2410s instead of the curved ones. And uh, like 15 minutes of Googling later, we found this really nice document that describes a USB firmware upgrade instruction, okay? And this instruction is just insultingly clear because the first instruction of this says the power goes into the power wall thing, right? And then the USB goes in the USB thing. But then, you know, it talks about this uh, U2410 ISP tool in, surf, in circuit or in service programmer. Uh, and then we get, you know, we started to get very interesting results, right? So we're seeing screenshots of this Dell utility that doesn't require any administrative privilege that, you know, starts up a bunch of stuff and at the end of the day, right, runs, you know, things like app tests and a lot of other mystery and uh, just does the firmware upgrade for you. So we looked at the, the output of this program. We said, you know, what is an app test? Like, what is this all about? We started Googling, right? We found a lot of 
you know, documents mentioning Genesis and G-Probe and, and all this other stuff. And we also found these documents from, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s that had this, all these mystery hardware that updates firmware from these really old monitors. So if you see the one on the bottom, there's a, a parallel port with power supply going to VGA, right? And somehow this hardware changes firmware on, on monitors. Uh, so we start Googling more, right? We find mention of SD Micro, Inalux, Athena, and Dell. So we're trying to figure out what this is all about, okay? Uh, like days and days of Googling later, we figured out roughly how this happened. So AppTest uh, is a thing that's used by G-Probe, which was created by a company named Genesis, and they were a big player in the on-screen display controller market, you know, in the early 2000s, right? From that, we did a lot of Googling, and here's what happened, okay? So in 2002, Genesis created G-Probe, and G-Probe, Genesis was in 2008 later sold to SD Micro, and the SD Micro threw in some of their IP and created this chip called the STDP6000 something, right? That chip was then sourced to Inalux, which is partially owned by Foxconn, which is then w something that's, the analyst built a board that was eventually used in Dell monitors, right? So this is how, you know, somebody wrote two various insecure code in 2002 that caused, you know, probably a few hundred million printer, uh, monitors in the world being vulnerable today. So that's, you know, how it happened basically. And uh, we were able to get a copy of G-Probe, right? So this is a screenshot of what it looks like. You know, the in pr interesting thing to look at here is, it, the software says we can connect to the monitor via things like serial, right, and also USB. And uh, we're looking at things like the DDC to BI, right? So that's something that's important we'll get, come back to later. So we got a copy of this from our update tool, right? We ran it in a virtual machine, we dumped uh, a lot of USB traffic, and we noticed that there are DDC packets embedded inside USB packets, okay? So Jaden's gonna talk a little bit about what DDC is? So uh, DDC is like a di display data channel communication set up by uh, VESA. So it is uh, used by the host adapter to query the monitor about the hardware capabilities, what is the vendor, what resolution it supports, and blah, blah, blah. And then if you go to this, there are multiple versions of uh, DDC which exist. Uh, there is DDC 2B, 2BI, AB, 2B+. And what we are working with here is 2BI, and which is, uh, a next version of 2B which works over I2C and talks to the host adapter. So here is what uh, initiation of uh, communication started with the host adapter to the monitor happens. It sends a SCSI command uh, with the code CF, uh, which is a generic vendor code, uh, and it is wrapped over, uh, it's wrapped in a USB mass storage uh, packet which is sent over to USB. Then uh, the U uh, USB request block contains a DDC 2BI packet which is an encapsulation over Gprobe packet uh, to do like different commands. So one of the commands, if you're looking here, is a run code command, which allows us to put PC anywhere in the monitor. How, how convenient, <laughs> right? And uh, if we look into the Gprobe documentation, right, uh, all of the checksum algorithms are, are laid out for you. They're very simple. So again, we're taking messages that are supposed to go into I2C, packing it into USB, and sending it over to the monitor via the USB interface. So okay, so yeah, let me show you a really simple uh, communication between the host and the, the monitor. So I'll play the monitor. Jad will play the host, okay? Uh, monitor, initiating communication. Give me register read. I as the monitor say, I acknowledge your request for initiation of communication. I acknowledge your acknowledgement that you started, uh, uh, you wanted to do initiate communication. Uh, okay, I have uh, acknowledged that you have run the read register command, end of acknowledgement. Okay, but we're not done yet, right? This is just to send the command. So this is like six packets to send a command. Uh, hey, monitor, let's do a communication again. Uh, give me the response of my previous command. I acknowledge your request for initiation of communication. I acknowledge your acknowledgement that you want to do communication. Okay, I have the result for you from read register, end of communication, goodbye. So 12 packets to get two bytes out of the monitor. <laughs> right, but uh, it works. You know, that's how, that's how the monitor is doing it. Right, and this is the mechanism that the monitor uses to update the firmware from USB into the on-screen display controller. Okay, so we read some documentation, let's void, void the warranty, let's figure out what the hardware looks like. So we opened up the back of the monitor, this is pretty typical, right, the top of the board is where all the power stuff is and the digital stuff is on the bottom, okay. And uh, here's an architectural diagram, right, so you have the main SD micro uh, chip on the upper left hand corner. Notice that that chip sits on an I2C bus which is connected to a multiplexer chip and that's the, uh, the 4053, right? And that multiplexer, again, sits on a second I2C bus, which is connected to a USB controller, right, which is the thing that we're talking to. So traffic comes 
into this USB controller, goes onto the I2C bus, goes through this multiplexer, then eventually ends up directly on the I2C bus for the uh, on screen display controller. So we're able to send raw I2C packets through USB to this machine. Okay, and that's how things work. And now uh, we flip the board over. This is pretty typical. We found an SPI flash chip that we were able to dump. So we dumped the code. And uh, this is something we like to do. We like to do 2D you know, visualization of entropy. Uh, so, you know, off the top of the, uh, off the top of our heads, we looked at this thing and we said, I have no idea what that is. That looks pretty sweet, right? Uh, it's high entropy followed by low entropy. There's certainly pattern there. Uh, this stuff, you know, somewhere in the middle probably looks like code. Uh, stuff over here, maybe data, right? It's high entropy, right? I mean, it's low entropy, but it looks like there's some stuff in there that's interesting and who knows, maybe this is compressed data. We don't really know. And then we took it and we just ran string on this thing and, you know, we're seeing a lot of stuff that were, you know, we saw in the documentation. So there's app tests, right? Mentions of, you know, picture in picture and things like OSD hide and OSD show, right? So, you know, this looks like we're on the right track. We want to play with these things. So then I said, obviously let's throw this in IDA and see what happens, right? And this is what IDA did, right? And, you know, we looked at it and we said, oh, this is really hard. We can't figure out how to disassemble Turbo 186, which is the, uh, the architecture here. So we started Googling around and it seems like somebody on OpenRCE in 2008 probably did exactly this research but maybe didn't tell anybody because they're asking about exactly the same architecture in exactly the same format and I think the binary is actually from one of these uh, firmware updates. So we looked at this and we said, oh, we don't like x86, we're going to do something more fun, right? And we put it down, we didn't work on it for like six months. Uh, and then 2016 comes along, right, and Jad and I are sitting around and this is really bothering us, you know, I have no idea how this works, like computers are hard, so we just write e ilfak an email, right? And uh, in six hours or eight hours, Igor responds and it says, like, here's a long insightful explanation of how IDA works in Turbo 186 and also already disassembled this thing for you, simple. So this Mars Hex is basically a, a piece of handler run on the monitor to update the firmware on the device. And he was, it was like a 200 kilobyte, um, I think 2 megabyte. Uh, and he reversed uh, everything and uh, it was perfectly uh, disassembled and he gave it back to us. So we thought like we will do something like this with the firmware of the monitor. Yeah, so you know, I read his email and I said, oh, I'm just gonna do exactly what you did, right? And I got segment city everywhere and nothing worked out and I failed. And then Jaden says, <laughs> so let's not do that. Let's be monkeys and press space. So we, we added a hotkey which, uh, if you add like um, space or like it jumps to different references, you won't get a control flow analysis, but at least it will help you in an analyzing things. So if, if Ofag is looking at it, please, sorry. Uh, so uh, while, so we have now, um, we can run code, but we want to do our, uh, we want to run some kind of code on it, right? So we, uh, we went through the gprobe um, documentation and we found three commands. One is the register read, which helps us to read any registers, run code, placing uh, PC anywhere we want, and uh, RAM write, which allows us to patch shell code uh, into the memory. And uh, there is no MMU, so this is, you can execute anywhere you want. Okay. So we want, so the, uh, the, there's a concept of app test, uh, which is basically a unit test inside the monitor. Uh, so it creates a context and it uh, tears down the context and does something inside it. Yeah, so now that we have this ability to write code into memory and then run code, right, we want to hijack something that seems like it might be useful uh, to see if we can do a, a very simple hello world. So we found there's one function that says, you know, OSD fill rectangle, right? That sounds like a good idea. We want to just put a rectangle on the screen to see if we can actually do this. Let's it patch off. it using gram right? Right, so Jaden wrote this thing and it turned out to be the grossest code that we've seen to that point. It gets way worse than this, right? So this is what it looks like. Uh, and I have, I have looked at it this for three weeks. Yeah, and if you stare at this for hours and hours, it will make you want to puke. Um, it will get gross. And Jaden definitely did stare at this for hours and hours. <laughs> okay, so now, Okay, now that we are able to dump some memory from the firmware, right, we're looking at the code with some, most of it disassembled, right? We noticed that mo the virtual memory address map is between this and this, okay? But there are all these far calls to this very mysterious memory region. So we started, uh, we thought like um, there is no reference to it and we do not understand how to get this code. So we started dumping code. Um, we um, so we wrote a USB dumper and uh, ima uh, so we took, uh, there is, there is a command which is listed called ram read, uh, but we were not able to make it work, although it, it works now. Uh, so we used uh, reg read, uh, which allowed us to dump two bytes at a time. So imagine like uh, doing those 12 packet transfer to get two bytes out. Uh, so uh, I wrote a memory dumper which allowed us to do a one megabyte dump per eight minutes. Per eight minutes. So remember those 12 c commands that you had to do, right? We're doing 
those USB commands for what is it, 100 bytes at a time, right? So yeah, we this is what we did. It was it was dump. Chad writes the USB dumper. We dump and we wait and we dump and we wait and we dump and it's very slow, right? And then Francois comes along and says, "Like you guys dump too slow. Like, I'm going <laughs> to totally do this differently." So he went off and he said, "I'm just going to re-implement the UART using G GPIO pins on the SOC. Uh, that's going to be way faster." And we're like, "No way, that's going to work." You know, two days later he comes back and he says. You are implemented. Okay, he also hijacked standard in and standard out. So all of a sudden, we had a UART over GPIO pins on the monitor that not only allowed us to dump arbitrary memory, it also allowed us to hijack all these these very important, very useful debug messages. So okay. it is uh, very important important to know that right now we were working with the assumption that there is only one uh, microcontroller in that SOC. Uh, but after dumping the F1000 range, we realized that it's actually a hardware abstraction layer to talk to another chip, uh, another processor inside the SOC. Which, which uh, is called OST now, on-screen display, whose uh, main uh, function is to display images on the, on, the on the monitor. But the other OCM, which is on-chip microcontroller, is actually talking to other devices, uh, other components inside the SOC and other um, external interfaces. So the, which is uh, 8000 to 8000 is mapped to with uh, OCM and, F uh, and OSD has its own code running inside SRAM uh, and its own Kind of process. Yeah. So at this point, you know, we know that we're now working with just one processor. There's at least two different processors inside the SOC, right? And they communicate using some memory map register that we don't really understand yet. And uh, we kind of hit a wall, so we spent like a million years Googling and clicking on pretty much everything that we're not supposed to, right? Until we found this beautiful site, Doc88, which is a place where people upload, you know, awesome proprietary documents for the internet and stuff. And uh, you probably want to open this in a VM, but uh, it did give us the exact data sheet for this chip that we're working with. And from there, we found pretty much everything we needed to know about how this chip worked. Uh, and we were right about this assumption that there is an OCM and an OSD chip and, or OSD processor and they're completely separate and they work more or less uh, asynchronously from each other. Okay, so now that we have the data sheet, we've done all this stuff, you know, let's try to display a picture, right? Let's get that to work. First, uh, there are three things we have to solve and if we solve these things, we, we got picture display, okay? We have to figure out where to transfer the image to the monitor. Right? We have to figure out how to trigger the image display function to, you know, display that image we transferred. And then we also have to figure out, you know, what a color is, right? How the color is represented in, in this monitor. So uh, when you start boot a Dell monitor, right, like this image comes up. So uh, the, the theory was that if you find this image, we will be able to find the code which loads this image and our quest will be over. But uh, I, I, we had a Sober and professional. Very, very sober, professional, very sober discussion and professional about discussion. About yeah. And uh, after a few hours, we came up with our own analysis, and uh, we both said that this is not a Dell image. So what is this on? Well, I mean, you know, so we looked at some part of the code, right? This clearly doesn't hold the Dell logo, right? But you know, what about stuff like this on the on the left side, right? Like maybe that's you know some representation of image. You know, what is the thing on the left, right? And if you stare at that for too long, it also does crazy things to your brain. Um, okay. So then you know, Francois comes along, right? And uh, we, you know, you know, after like after a few days, uh, he came up with me like multiple megabytes of data to stare at, and uh, I looked at it for hours. And uh, duh, <laughs> come on, that's obviously an OSD command packet. Uh, right. I mean, don't you see that? Obviously, right. <laughs> this is just you know, in memory at runtime, right? Just a big old blob of binary. And John stares at this thing, and he says, obviously, this is this structure. So uh, this OSD command packets allows the OSD to display packet uh, anywhere in the screen. You can specify the coordinates, you can specify the size, you can specify the color, how many bits per pixel have to be used. Uh, and uh, what we understood after a lot of reverse analysis uh, of the um, IROM, uh, which is the hardware abstraction layer, uh, th this is how it actually works. So you write uh, the OSD packet inside the OCM virtual memory map, and then you engage a DMA engine to map this memory over to the SRAM of OSD. And uh, as along, like uh, as OSD is working asynchronously, uh, it reads the packet and displays the image. And the similar way, you can transfer the image to the OSD using the DMA memory mapping. So this solved our first two questions, which was transfer and display image, right? And uh, the APIs which were used to do this was SDRAM read uh, to check, verify our write, and the SDRAM write, which helped us to do all this, and this is what we came with. This is the, probably the most gross blinking, uh, box blinking program I have ever written. And this if you look at it for hours, you, I have definitely vomited once. Uh, hold on, wait. You got to see it. You guys all have to watch this with us now. Wait, hold on. Why doesn't it? 
So you will see. No, it doesn't want to play. Hold on. No, no, no. You, you're not going to get. come up. You're not off the hook. You got to watch this video. Okay, so as you see that the block, I'm able to like move the box around anywhere on the screen. And oh, it's so uh, nauseating. There, is, there was a blinky bug, which I figured out after a week on. All right, but this is after days of looking at this nonstop. Mm -hmm. So the last question we have to figure out, you know, what is a color, right? I mean, is a 32-bit color? How is it represented? So we did the reasonable thing and filled a rectangle with rows and rows of, you know, colors, incremental value from zero, one, two, three, four, et cetera. Uh, so instead of getting very similar colors, we got these colors, right? So, you know, why is color zero this basically the same as color two? Why is one totally different? Okay, and uh, we didn't really know. Let's do some science. We take a tiny little microscope and we point it at specific pixels in order for us to figure out what you know, color gets rendered into what um, pixel value. So we filled it every rectangle with the value OX33. Okay, and this is what we saw. So if you look at it, like R is blank, G is 100%, and B is 100%. Right. So this is you know individual pixel cells that we're looking at. And then we said, okay, let's do instead of you know, the same pattern we do OX33, OX00, OX33, OX00. So, John, how many bits does the monitor use to represent each color? Uh, on each its pixel? obvious. So, if you see zero represents transparency and there are two pixels missing, so it's four bit per pixel. Right. And then. How do you encode colors with four bits, right? In normal RGB world, each color, each component is represented using eight bit, and there is an alpha component, uh, so it represents a 32 bit color. So, how do you do this on? Yeah, so right, if you have four bits, then you can have one bit for R, one bit for B, you know, et cetera, and that's clearly not what's happening here. So it turns out this monitor uses a thing called color lookup table, which is basically this index structure, right, that uses four bits to index into 32 bit colors. So this allows you to save space, right? You can have at most 16 different colors, but you can have colors that are 32 bit deep. Um, so now the big question is how, wh where is the lookup table? Can we change it? Can we modify it? Uh, and then we did a very, you know, again, very sober, very co a collaborative work with Francois, right? And we did this for days and days to try to figure this out where he dumped lots of memory and we helped a lot. And uh, like two days later, okay, we finally find the structure that we think is the lookup table. So it works in a similar way how we were transferring the images and the command package. So you, you generate a specific color lookup table structure and you write it to the OSM memory, uh, memory map that uh, memory region over to the SRAM of OSD, OSD picks it up and displays the color for that specific image. Okay, and so we have everything we need. Okay, we're gonna display, display a photo. Images. <laughs> and we did it. Okay, so look at that. We have tiny little SSL logs. We have as, as many as we want wherever we want and that was sort of the point of this, right? Uh, but I looked at it and I said, we still have only 16 colors and that SSL lock actually had something like 20. 26. 26 colors, so that's not enough colors, John. We gotta get more colors. It's really hard, it has been really hard now. Yeah. So we went through some docs and uh, we figured out like uh, it do the hardware does support at least eight bit per pixel. So uh, in, in till recon we didn't have, we had only four bit per pixel but now we have uh, fixed up to get 256 colors and the code is submitted into GitHub. Uh, but after going over more analysis of the documentation, the register documentation list we found, we, we found a breakpoint. So, which means that we can halt the monitor, figure out everything, and this is after like 90% of the research we have already done. And we have spent like weeks on it, uh, even months. And now, if if we would have access to this breakpoint, we would have finished it in probably like half, one and a half weeks or two weeks. Yeah. So at this point, Jad and I just kind of like put our hands up in there. I was like, oh, I can't believe we missed that one. Right? That's terrible. You know, so we said, like, interns, go do the rest of it, right? Breakpoint everything, reverse it, tell us what it is, and friends will help. So the interns went out, uh, dumped the stack, dumped the heap, you know, found pretty much everything we needed to do all the demos that I'll show you later. Uh, and then we find the treasure. This was very surprising because we, the OSD should be allowed to display a pixel on the image, on the, on the screen, but it should, it is very surprising that it has the capability to read pixels anywhere on the screen. And what can you do with that now? Yeah. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So we presented some of this research uh, at Recon and after the presentation, people who actually knew how monitors work came up to us and said like, hey stupid, you don't actually even need the USB cable because you know, there are eight, uh, I2C channels on uh, DVI, HDMI and VGA, et cetera. So we actually ported the code to run over the I2C interface and now our demos do not require USB at all. Although it can be done over both channels. Um, and that stuff is on GitHub today. Now, 
let's have some fun with it, right? Let's make a monitor implant. So let's assume that we have a very simple base implant in the monitor, okay? And let's also assume that I'm a sneaky guy and I have control over a pixel, right? So if I blink the pixel, I should be able to transmit data to my, you know, base monitor implant and I can do something very much similar to a command and control, right? So every time I sample a pixel, I can change the data and I can do something like a command type, data, 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 which allows me to load arbitrary code, arbitrary data, execute code and do all sorts of other things. Now, we take this pixel, we put it on the internet, right? And as we know, the internet is used for one thing, right? So we can put this pixel on photos of cats, right? We can do YouTube videos of cats. We can even do, you know, movies about cats. And once we do this, we can distribute this pixel down to millions and millions of monitors and we can update them all at the same time and we can have direct command and control down to those exact monitors, okay? And within our organization, this is commonly known as cat-based world domination plan number seven, okay? Uh, now, so in the end, what do we do? Okay, we figured out that we can change whatever pixel on the screen whenever we want. Uh, we can also see every pixel on the screen, which is really cool. And uh, for those folks who have followed our previous research, we even got Fontana to work on the monitor as well, but that's its own conversation that we'll have later. So, you know, enough talk, right? We're gonna do some demos, okay? Uh, and then, first I have to figure out how this works. No, you gotta. We swear there's a natural monitor under this, this table and the demo is now rigged. Uh, but shooting a camera at the monitor is a little bit difficult. So, does it work? I think you're. No. Hey, you have to put on spec. This thing? Okay. This tape? Oh. All right, wait, there we go. All right. Okay. So, I'm going to talk from sitting at the table. Yeah. <laughs> so, first, I'm going to show you how to put random people p pictures on the screen and you can uh, not remove it. So I'm gonna, so this is Shakib as we talked about and his picture is gonna be on the monitor. So this is a typical, you know, the Ubuntu machine, no uh, administrative privilege and we're just showing, you know, putting an image on the screen. Now we didn't do this in GitHub but we can actually make this permanent. So imagine if that happened to you how terrible your life would be, right? So my s second attack will be, you all know about 4chan, right? And it is not, uh, it doesn't have any TLS uh, capabilities, but I'm gonna give it to you. We're gonna secure 4chan for everybody. We okay. did. So check it out, right? Can you like move it a little bit if you can see that closely, right? So we get to put SSL locks wherever we want and if we just line it up right, it'll be right on the browser where the SSL lock ought to be. So now 4chan has SSL, so yay. Uh, the next attack will be the, you, if you guys know about HMI interfaces uh, where, you know, in power plants and uh, how an operator uh, determine what has gone wrong in a power plant system or a nuclear fission system. So the, if you look at that green light, it tells that uh, that uh, whatever gun barrel is perfectly working fine, but I'm gonna change that to. Yeah. Right, so what if we were able to right, show the different status of the, in the industrial control system just by changing the pixels that said this pump is good, this pump is bad. What if we are able to change the operator's behavior just by ch changing the pixels on the monitor Right, we have a fundamental trust of, you know, we trust that whatever pixel is coming out of the computer would be displayed on the monitor and we're seeing that this is actually not even true, okay? So the last one we're gonna do is we're gonna show gonna the, uh, the, the blinky pixel command and control yeah, thing that so we talked about. So on the left side, right, we have a PayPal page or a PayPal account. Uh, I don't have any money in this PayPal account, which is really sad. Uh, Jaden's gonna change that for me, right? I'm gonna put, how much money do you want? Maybe? Like a million dollars. Okay, let's do it. One million dollars. All right, so I also gave it uh, SSL protection, that phishing page. Great, and there you I go. put a million dollar on. And the way this is working is there's a tiny little blinky pixel on the right screen that's communicating to the monitor, telling the monitor to put this image at this specific pixel value, and uh, we can do this, of course, in real time. But Ang, I don't want to give you a million dollar. I want to change it now. On, in no. Real time. No, let me, let me. <laughs> so what we are doing is uh, we're gonna, so let's suppose if you are going, we're gonna, 
send a command and control packet over from our server. Oops. Is it even working? Oops. Sorry. My server has gone down. Okay, so anyway, that's the demo, right? And all the uh, all the code that went into this demo is up on our GitHub. Oh, it's, up, uh, it's, up. it's working. It's working. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna give you how much you want, whatever. Uh, to no, yeah. Okay. So anyway, all the code that went into this demo is on GitHub already. Uh, the link is on. The okay. So let's talk about what this means. Okay, implication-wise. You know, the first question is, you know, how big is this problem really, right? We looked at a single on-screen display implementation for one type of monitor. Uh, you know, we certainly found some vulnerabilities in it, but, you know, is this a pervasive thing? So to answer that question, we bought four other types of monitors that are very common. You know, they're on the budget end of things, 24-inch monitor, monitors that are approximately between 100 to $200. Okay, we, we looked at Samsung, Dell, Acer, HP. And uh, what's inside these guys, uh, these chips, these boards, uh, the bad news is they're not uh, SD micro. They don't run G code or G probe. Uh, the good news is this one is Amstar, that one is Amstar, this one is also Amstar, and so is this one, right? So it seems like Amstar is uh, you know, a very pervasive, very uh, popular uh, OSD controller that's used in the lower, uh, the cheaper segment of the market. And it turns out this really cool dude named Alex Boglin already did all the work for us. So he figured out the way to uh, do firmware update to all the Amstar uh, uh, on-screen controllers. And uh, this is actually a, a feature inside the, uh, the Linux kernel now, right? So that's the link. This work has already been done. Um, so it looks like the same type of vulnerability that's fundamental to the Dell monitor is also within, it's also inside all of these other MSTAR monitors, which means, you know, that we've probably made more than a billion monitors, right, so in the last 10 years. And most of those, it looks like, will be vulnerable to some type of attack like this, okay? And uh, the next question is, you know, how practical is this attack? Well, I mean, you guys have to, make up your own mind about it, right? But keep in mind that we don't have to have any privilege uh, on, the, on the computer in order to launch this type of thing. So any unprivileged code execution will allow permanent persistent firmware modification inside the monitor, right? And uh, the last big question is, you know, how realistic is this fix? You know, because I, the way to fix this now, right, without a physical recall would be to have the vendor distribute a firmware update tool that patches some of these, you know, insecurities about firmware update and code execution, okay? But if they did that, they would also release exactly the algorithm and the pr protocol for updating all the firmware on all the monitors. So this is you know, not exactly a simple thing to do. Um, and, uh, you know, this is um, something that I would like the community to talk about. You know, is monitor security important? I think it is. How do we actually uh, secure the monitors that we have now, right? And how do we build more secure monitors in the future. So uh, that's pretty much my presentation. And uh, I have to say this, you know, we're, we're from uh, Rebel and Security. We do embedded security stuff when we're hiring. So if you want to do this type of research, uh, get in touch with us. And also, big thanks to Con Connor Abbott, who did a lot of the demo code. Uh, Bob drew all the stuff that wasn't terrible. And uh, Brian also helped a lot, and he's in the front row. So thank you very much. This is where the code is uh, for the, all this work. Uh, check it out.